just start off with this. The church has been around for nine years, right? We celebrated our nine-year anniversary this year, and uh, it's been a journey of a lot of complications, obstacles, challenges, but also great reward, great blessings, great favor, great a lot, a lot of great everything, a lot of healing in people's lives, a lot of restoration, many people coming to Christ, and it's it's been great, right? So it was worth the pain of some of the things that we have to experience. And because of that, we, everybody say we. We. If this is your church, we, together, we have been not only impactful in our city, which is great, I think we should definitely be impacting our city, which, by the way, we have family thrown out on October 31st, Halloween, and we will be seeing, I'm believing, 2,500 people here. Last year we had 1,700. This year, 2,500, maybe more. I don't know. But we're impacting our city in various ways. But... We also believe in impacting the world. And in nine years, we've been able to uh, see the potential in different people's lives and, and see the call of God on them and want to be a part of what God is doing in them and through them. And in nine years, so uh, we have a Elevate Church Morelia, Mexico. We have a Elevate Church Oaxaca, Mexico. We have eKids Global that helps at-risk children from sex trafficking, labor trafficking, and, um, and organ trafficking, and obviously it's expanding as uh, my wife and I are directors of uh, Zoe International for Latin America. Then there's Japan, which opens in 2020. Our team's already there. They are, they're ready. They are so ready to get this bad boy opened up. And then we got Clarksville, Tennessee, that's already doing amazing things in Tennessee. Um, but, you know, we're not done yet. God places a, a call on people's lives. God places a plan, a purpose in every single one of our lives. And listen, not every, not every purpose is a platform, right? If you're called to a platform, whether it's a platform in ministry, whether it's a platform in medicine, whether it's a platform in government, regardless of the platform, it should always be used for God. How many agree with that? Every single platform, whatever it is that you do, should be used for God. If you're in the entertainment industry, the music industry, that platform is for Jesus. That's all I know. And, um, and so these are all amazing leaders that are all leading these, these wonderful ministries now. And uh, we get to see the blessing. You know, for example, Morelia is already up to two services. They're blowing it up. Oaxaca just went to their second service. You have Tennessee. They just went to their second service. You have uh, Japan. They're just trying to get started. Uh, but we already found um, the place. We're going to be having our services at the um, University of Japan. That's the location we're going to be using for our church services. The counselor of the school is now a part of our Elevate Church Japan team, which is awesome. Incredible. Incredible. Love it. And, uh, and then Pastor Bruce, he was just here maybe, I, I think, a month ago, and, and he's just doing amazing things. So, and eKids Global is doing amazing. They, these kids are transformed. Amazing, amazing when you walk into the school. Um, we just got back, and we were shocked how changed these kids were. Like, shocked. Like, who are you guys? Shocked. It was amazing to see the transformation, because when we first got them, they didn't know how to brush their teeth, comb their hair. I mean, they just didn't know life skills, and today, they're brilliant. So we did this. This is awesome. I love that. Now, we are going to expand. There's a couple in our church that uh, my wife and I have known for 12 years. And we've seen them in their highs, their lows, their ups, their downs, their all arounds. And, um, and we know that when God puts his hand on, on someone, it's evident after knowing them for years and seeing their fruit. And, um, and we have a couple that's going to be launching a church also uh, now elevate church and uh, the state will be utah it'll be actually saint george utah will open in uh in in 2020 we're still figuring out dates and uh it's it's exciting because we get to be a part in some little way of of seeing someone fulfill their god-given purpose and that's what we love at elevate church and so I want to just quickly say something very special about these two wonderful people. Known them for 12 years. They've been consistent, faithful. They launched Elevate Church with us when we first started nine years ago. So they've seen our ups, downs, all arounds. And we know that starting a church is not easy. It's the most challenging thing you can do. Um, and uh, But it's the most rewarding thing you can do when you see lives changed. And um, nine, uh, I'm sorry, 12 years of seeing them be faithful to God. Uh, raising their, their family and pursuing God as a family and have seen them when, when things were very, like, I mean, we're talking where miracles were needed and seen them stand in faith and, and fight the good fight of faith 
And one thing I can say about this couple, the Bible says this, when you appoint pastors, elders, leaders, uh, there's one part of a verse that you find in Ephesians that says is that they are lovers of what is good. And there's something special when you find a Christian that is a lover of what is good. That's what God is looking for in the body of Christ. And these people have, have literally portrayed lovers of what is good, always looking to love anything that's good and definitely anything that's God. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to give the most amazing love because you're lovers of what is good, right? So let's go extra, extra love today. And uh, let's welcome Nick and Sogo Pooley. Come on up, guys. Come on up. So Nick and Sogol, you guys can be seated. Thank you so much for showing that love. Uh, Nick and Sogol, um, let me just ask you guys a real quick question because I know that so often many times people see what we do but don't know why we do what we do. And it's easy for people just to question like, well, why, um, you know, are you guys doing this? Why are you guys doing that? And those are, you know, good questions, right? We have to know why. Um, but I, wanna, I want them to hear why, why Utah? Why St. George Uter? You know what I'm saying? Like, why? How did that come about? And uh, I know that we sat um, at my kitchen table with my wife uh, almost three years ago, and we had this discussion, and we said, God's timing. God's timing will be perfect. It was just something that was being birthed, but it wasn't ready. It was just in the, you know, in the cooker, and, uh, and we're just waiting. But, but why Utah? So, well, it's taken a lot of years of being obedient to what God's told us to do <laughs> before he revealed the why to us. I was telling Pastor that earlier. And um, I have family in Utah, my sisters, my stepdad, I mean my stepdad, my dad and my stepmom um, are out there. So we've been visiting back and forth. Um, but as far as moving there, it was never really on our radar. Once it was revealed to us in prayer that we were to plant a church and do ministry with our amazing pastors. By the way, let's give it up for amazing pastors. Thank you for everything you said. Seriously, I meant to start with that, how grateful That's I am that we've been under your covering. And, and this just being, being the amazing pastors and being obedient to your call is what has meant allowed us to, to see what our why in our life. So uh, thank love you. you. So anyway, so um, we, it was revealed to us that we were to plant a church and we were praying and in a season of prayer and fasting. Um, we were thinking, oh, we're going to go to Austin, Texas, somewhere cool like that. You know, let's go move there. All um, of Texas is saved. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's still some one church there. Every church blows up in Texas. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, thousands it's too of easy, thousands. Right? Yeah. So I was in a season of prayer and fasting, and God revealed to me um, St. George. And I, I literally said out loud, um, no, I don't, I don't want to go there. And, um, and I said to the Lord, I said, okay, well, you tell Sogol, and then maybe we'll talk about it. Uh, and I didn't say a word to her. And then three months later, this was three years ago, three months later, she, we're sitting in our living room, and she goes, you know, I really feel that we should plant in St. George. And I was like, uh, here we go. <laughs> so, um, and then after that, confirmation after confirmation, I linked up with um, a lot of former Mormons who, have, who are now born again Christians who are out of the church, um, linked up with an author who wrote a book about her whole family um, leaving the church, just a lot of confirmation over, over, and over again. Um, God showing us this is this is what I have for you. And again, this is after years of being obedient and, and not knowing why he's telling us to do things um, for him to start to reveal that. And then in the research, really seeing the why and, and, and him really, you know, the song Break My Heart for What Breaks Yours, it's like really breaking my heart for, for what breaks his. And Utah has the fifth highest suicide rate in the country. Utah has a, uh, an opiate issue, a heroin addiction. There's human trafficking that's a problem. There's a lot of youth and young adults that are turning to suicide because of the oppression. If you leave the Mormon church, you are ostracized. You are outcast from your family. Regardless, it's just they completely push you out. And what um, was that whole stat on porn? Uh, Utah is the state of Utah is the highest downloaded porn rate of any state in the, in the country. Yeah. Um, so there is definitely oppression. Um, and then visiting, too, there's a culture of people that maybe not even Christians, that the only Jesus they know is what the LDS Church and the Mormon Church shows them. And there's yeah. also a culture of people who have been hurt by the church and, like I said, ostracized out of it. And especially St. George, um, there's a lot of that as well. So just going there, years of visiting and yeah. seeing that and starting to have a heart for that community. And then there's also confirmation to Sogol uh, specifically, which was really interesting. So we're Elevate Church, right? Um, <laughs> 
I hope for you know me, that. this whole journey, it's been coming up with reasons why not to go. Yeah. And not There's been a lot of that. Go. And it's really, you know, you have, we have our kids and they're comfortable, great school, great community, great family, great church, great pastors, right? So why would I, you know, say, pick me and let's go to this isolated land where I'm like the only brown person. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I was recently there with uh, Nick and St. St. George, Utah. Man, it's like, it, it was like Wonder Bread Land. It was, everybody was white. You know, and I was, you know, because, you know, certain states, it's, it's interesting, you know, which, hey, listen, I love diversity. I do well with any culture, any race. I know how to connect with people. I love people. But man, I honestly thought, I'm like, I don't know how they're going to receive me here. Because I was like the only brown. You think you're brown. I mean, this is brown right here. You know what I'm saying? You know, you got Wonder Bread and you got Tortilla, right? Here. Wow. And, and when, I, when I went to St. George, Utah, because I went to go scout the land with him. We walked the land. We prayed the land. And we're just seeking God, okay, you know, where, where are we going to plant this church? Where, where are we going to start this? And, uh, and the oppression that's there is very thick. I mean, it's, you walk in there, you feel the oppression. It reminded me, reminded me of Newhall, of how we first started. Uh, but it's not like the New Hall's like, man, you walk here, it's just filled with joy. Well, you walk there, I can feel. And I told him, like, man, this feels so oppressive. It feels like, it feels like when we started Elevate Church, it was so just people are down. And, and, and when they would see us, they were just like, man, there's something different about you guys. And it's the light of Jesus, obviously. But the people were so receptive. The people were so loving. The people were so accepting, you know. And, and even though I was, you know, I'm, I'm his, not was, I am Hispanic. <laughs> I think I'm still Hispanic, I think. They were just so, like, embracive. I was shocked in a community that's, that's, that's the majority is like, what, what percentage is white? Uh, 80% white. 80% white, and then 20% of everything else. I don't think we saw one black person there. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was like, man, I'm not kidding you. But guess what? One thing that we talked about, because as a church, we believe in diversity. Amen. We believe in reaching every nation. We believe in reaching every creed, every color, every race, because that's what heaven is going to look like. And, uh, and I believe that, Nick and Sogo, that you guys are going to bring that, and you guys are like magnets anyways. Uh, and you're just so loving and caring, but go on, sorry. So, I had to say that. So for me, it's all the reasons why not to go. And then you kind of look at this map of the U.S., and really Utah is the only state that I would say has its own religion. Um, you know, in California so and different states, right? Even the government is, is, you know, you get to the higher places of government, and really it's all ran according to, you know, their... I don't want to say cult, but they're very, you know, religious beliefs and all those things. So for me, when I look down at this map, I go, wow, there's, there is no talk about the real Jesus. Yeah. And, you know, we're passionate about seeing people, you know, encounter the real Jesus here at Elevate Church. And so for me, it's like, yeah, I want to go there and I want them to know the real loving Jesus that yeah. radically changed, saved, transformed, and did so many miracles for me, and I want to be an extension of that. I want our family to be an extension of that. So I was in my kitchen one time, and the Lord said to me, he said, Google, because God is a God of technology, he said, <laughs> Google the slogan for Utah. So every state has a slogan. Don't know if you guys know that, but now you know. So I Google it, I hit image, and there it is. It says, Utah, life elevated. And I was like, okay, God, we're doing this. We're going to go <laughs> elevate life in Utah. Come on. I love that. I love that. And Give God a big hand. And like Sogol said, the vision of the church is that we're passionate about seeing people connect with Jesus or, or connect with God in a real way through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they say they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they don't have a real, they don't have a connect, a real connection with Jesus Christ. And that's what we're, we're believing to bring. Oh, and I just wanted to mention that my sister came to visit about three years ago. This was our time of confirmation. And she came to a service here and she lives in St. George as well. And after the service, she was, she was super pumped up I and mean, she's Christian. She goes to a church out there 
um, which their churches are, are pretty dead compared to what we do here. But she said after the service, she so said. No, we're not comparing. No, no, no. no yeah, but yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. saying that the, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, not, yeah, there's no yeah. spiritual churches. Yeah, right, there. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so she literally says, you guys need to put a church like this out there. <laughs> she literally, and she, little did she know at that time that was a seed in our hearts because at this time we're seeking God for confirmation of is this where, where we're supposed awesome. to go. So. I love that. Amen. Well, praise God. Would you all please stretch your hands out? And if I can get the pastors and elders to come up, let's pray for them. Let's pray. Yes, Nicholas and Sogol. And while they're coming up, did you want to just share something, babe, anything that's on your heart? Well, I just want to say uh, that we're so proud of you guys. I have known you for a long time, Sogol, 12 years. I think I met her first, okay, so... But, but I just want to say that you guys have been so consistent. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I appreciate about the two of you, and especially you, Sogo, is that she knows that pastors are human. Do you know that pastors are human, right? So that means that she's been there. You've been so consistent not only on to, with your faith and everything, but you have been there for me in my good times, my bad times, my all-around times. Yeah. And, and I, I believe that that's the real Jesus. That is when we get to show who God is and who his son is. So I just know that God is going to fulfill his desire through your lives. That's and I right. know that Utah will get to know our Jesus because of the two of you. So thank you so much for obeying God. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. you know, this is something beautiful. There's, there's, there's sometimes in family, but also church family, sometimes there's ripping and then there's sending. And, um, and we, we're, we're blessed and honored to send you uh, to go do what God's called you to do. And we know without a shadow of a doubt how you exit is how you enter your next season. And you guys have exited very well and praying that you enter in with God's divine favor. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this power couple. We thank you for the mantle and the anointing that you've placed on their life, Father. Lord, we know that today what we're doing is not something that we take lightly because we know why we're doing what we're doing. We know that Utah needs Jesus. We know that Utah needs deliverance and healing. We know that there are children, youth, and family members that need restoration, that need healing. But Lord, we also know that we're not the only church that we want to see in Utah, specifically in St. George. Lord, we pray that this couple would be that, that starting point for many churches, Father God. Churches that believe in your power. Churches that believe in restoration. Churches that believe in the divine love of Jesus Christ, the unconditional love, would also begin to plant there as well. So we pray, Father, for divine connections. Lord, we pray, Father God, Lord, that you're already setting up even the Elevate team, Father God, that will surround them and uphold them uh, as, they, as they begin to establish and build the church, Father. We thank you, Father God, that you are the provision for all vision, Father. And Lord, with you, we lack nothing, Father God. Lord, the step that we're taking today is the leap to their moon, Father God. We're believing that they're going to arrive safely with their children, and their children, Father, will grow up in the ways of God. And all the days of their life, they will serve you and never depart. So we plead the precious blood of Jesus over the Pooley family. And we declare that no weapon formed against them will ever prosper. I thank you, Father God, that only health and healing will they experience all the days of their life, Father God. We thank you that everywhere the sole of their feet touch, they'll prosper and have good success, Father God. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you who has begun the good work in them, You'll complete it and fulfill that until the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, today as a church, we stretch out our hands in faith. We stretch out our hands in agreement. And we declare, Father God, that heaven has spoken. And that you desire, Father, to see Utah be saved. And so, Lord, we send them by faith. We declare that they will be doing great and mighty works in your name. And we declare all this in Jesus' name. If church, you believe that, say amen, amen. amen. We love you guys, man. Seriously. I love you. Love you so, Golito. All right. Thank you, pastors, elders, for hanging out. Appreciate that. Thank you. Can I get my Bible, please? Thank you. All right. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Woo! We wanted to make sure that you guys were a part of the business today. 
Because you know what? We want you to see that we don't do things for a matter of people saying, look at what Elevate Church is doing. We do things because there's a why behind what we do. There is a why behind our what we do. And I want to just share with you for whatever few minutes I have left that there's also a why inside of you. And that why is so crucial to your life. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, and I'm praying that today um, that you would all have the capacity to, to re really reevaluate yourself, to reevaluate your life and ask yourself the honest question of, do I even know why I do what I do? Do I understand why I think the way I think? Do I understand why I talk the way I talk? Do I understand why I believe the way I believe? And to really take the scriptures and, and to, to take God's word at face value, when God says in his word, he says, examine yourself whether or not you are still in the faith. It, that word examine is to evaluate to check yourself before you wreck yourself, to make sure that you are still a consistent, committed follower of Jesus Christ, that you still understand why you were born. Come on, how many of that? None of us were born by accident. Every single one of us were born with a divine purpose, and our job is to discover that with God, not alone. Amen? Because it's easier to just pick out whatever you want to do, and that's great. You can pick out whatever you want to do. But I want to be in God's perfect will. I want to know why I'm on this earth. And I pray that you have that same desire as we are entering a new year 2020 that we don't forget that we still have two months left in order for us to progress, in order, in order for us to change, in, in order for us to improve our life. We can still be better at everything we do and everything we are. But we have to come back to our why. When you think about success just in general, the world knows how to get success, doesn't it? They're good at that, aren't they? When you look at corporations, when you look at organizations that are, you know, pretty popular out there, for example, I'm just going to use Apple as an example just to give you a quick illustration. When you think about Apple, I mean, how many people here have an iPhone? Lift your hands. Okay, good Lord. That's like 98% of you guys. Okay, at the ADM, it was the same thing, man. Just about every single hand went up. And you know why? You know why most of us have uh, iPhones? Because we love our product. But there was always a why. For example, there's this thing that you can learn in business, okay? I'm going to go a little bit leadership today. There's something called the golden circle that businesses use a lot. And so it's, it's nothing new. This has been around for years. But companies really take on this type of structure because they, they understand the value. Everybody say value. They understand the value of wanting to be the top 3% of, of the world's success, even the world's economy. But here's what I'm thinking. We have the greatest, most amazing book in the world called the Holy Bible. And we should be the greatest beneficiaries of what God has promised us, but it's interesting how the world keeps becoming more and more successful because they know how to apply God's word, but they're blind about it. But I can take a scripture for every single organization of what their core values are, of what their systems look like, and I can literally put a Bible verse next, not only to what they do, but why they do it that way. Are you with me today? So I want us to grow up. Look at your neighbor and tell them, we're going to grow. Okay, so here's how it works. So it's, it's basically three layers. The outer part is always the what. Everybody say what. The next one is say how. And then the third one is why. But here's the, here's the deal. Most people only live by what. It's what they see. It's what they do. And they don't grow beyond that what. So we live very, we'll just call it surface Christianity when we're talking about being fully committed with God, okay? So it's very surface. We, we go to church, you know, we, we, we listen to podcasts, we listen to sermons, um, you know, we, we, we read our Bible here and there, but, but there's, there's, there's no graduation, there's no next level, and so we know what to do, right? Because Christians are really good at what to do, what to say, how you doing, praise God, great, praise the Lord, right? We just, we know what to do. And, and the truth is this, is that when you think about what, 
when it comes to an organization like, let's just say, Apple, uh, or just, let's just take every possible organization you can think of, Apple, Sony, uh, Dell, HP, just think of all those. They all 100%, they know what they do. That's, that's not the issue. People know what they do. But very few, very, very few, what sucks is they, they don't know how or few know how they do what they do. Very few. Like, have you ever met someone, like I've met with pastors before, and I see like, man, their ministry is blessed. I'm like, so how did you do that? Like, how did you, like, start establishing a specific ministry? And you know what? They, I've heard pastors tell me this. Oh, I'm just blessed, praise God. I just prayed. I just, and then God just, just blessed. I'm like, well, duh, that's the given. Okay, but how did you do it? Give me some, give me some handles so I can carry this bad boy back to Elevate Church. And there's nothing worse than to have Christians that can't tell you how they progressed their life, how they got healed, how they became better, how they've improved. And, and listen, and there's some intelligent people in church, but even intelligent people don't know how. Are you hearing me today? Okay, so mind you, this, this is what the world thinks. This is all scriptural, and I'll prove it to you. So very few know how. And definitely, most people don't even know why they do what they do. So when I talk about why, I'm talking about, you know, why you wake up every single day and do life. Like, why did you come to Elevate Church today? Like, why, you know, did you dress yourself up? Like, why do you wake up and do what you do every single day? And I think most often, most of us don't even know why. I think a lot of us know what we're supposed to do. We are to go to work. We are to feed the children. We are to do watch a few movies, and, and we get stuck on this, what we do every single day, and we can live there so comfortable and never progress and, or progress and never change and, and never improve our, our lifestyle. I mean, have you ever asked yourself, why do I have that attitude? Have you ever asked yourself, why do I always perceive negatively? Why do I always complain? How about this one? Why am I always sick? Why do I even believe what I believe? And do I believe what I believe? Why haven't my children changed? Why hasn't my family been healed? And so we start asking ourselves these questions. And when you start asking yourself these questions, here's what you're doing. Your why will explain your what. Your why will explain your what. What are you doing right now that you're unhappy with? We'll find out why. I, found, I have found that most destructive cycles definitely are based out of what a person keeps doing, but they never come out of them because they don't know why they keep doing that. And once you can explain your what, then I'm telling you, your why just comes to life. And now you have a why I need to change. Now you have a why I need to improve. Now you have a why I need to grow in this walk with God. If not, you'll just be comfortable the rest of your life, and you'll just kind of be casual about your Christianity. You'll be casual about your faith. You'll be casual about how you raise your children. You'll be casual about how you live your own personal life. And uh, let me tell you, most people are, are very unhappy. Would you agree with that? So we got to come back to why we say why. why? That's right. So that's the whole golden circle thing. Uh, there's a great book. I forgot his name. Simon says something like that. And uh, he's got a book called uh, It All Starts With Why, which is great. I love that. You know, I think it's great to read all these amazing, wonderful books, but ain't nobody give it to me like the Bible does. I tell you, I can get so much now. I believe I'm a learner. I'm a reader. I love leadership. I love all that stuff. But I'll tell you, there's, there's no organization that has gotten the wisdom they have uh, without God in some way because I tell you what they apply is all biblical and they're successful 
And I pray that we would be the church that is successful in everything we do. Successful in family. It's not just about, we talked about this, you know, last week. It's not just about going to the moon and, yay, I, I, I not only discovered my dream, but I'm living the dream. Yeah, you can live the dream with a jacked up soul. Right? So what good does it do you to gain the whole world and lose yourself? It does us no good. God cares about the inner man more than he cares about what you do. Are you with me? So, so let's take uh, Apple. So Apple, uh, I would say because 90, 98% of you lifted your hand probably today. Y'all have iPhones. Personal opinion, I like Apple, okay? I don't like HP. I don't like, I don't like a lot of those because they all have, listen, they all have the same technology. They all can do the same thing. Same thing goes with, you know, uh, television company. Tony, uh, I mean, Sony. What, what are some other uh, TV companies? <laughs> Someone should start a Tony. <laughs> oh, Tony's my barber, praise God. <laughs> Sony, LG, who? Vizio, Sam to the Sun. Uh, what else? Okay, whatever. Okay, but but let's let's just look at all these companies. They're all the same. They they all have the same technology. They all have the same product right, or similarities to the product. It's the same stuff. Same goes with Christians. Same goes with people. Listen, we're God's people. We're all God's people. Every single one of us have been given gifts. We've been given talents. We've been given things in order for us to progress. So it's beautiful that we all have a, a similarity, right, of God's creation we do, right? Just some change, little things that are different from one another, but isn't it interesting that not all inspire? Not all of them inspire. For example, when you think about Apple, Apple is very smart in how they put out their product. And here's why. Let's just take Apple and their computers. We know that's how they started. Apple started with computers, but so did Dell and HP. And so let's say Apple said something like this. Apple comes to you and starts marketing you, wants you to buy in. And Apple says to you, hey, um, this is our computer. It's sleek. It's user-friendly. It's, uh, it's, you know, color is nice. I mean, just very, very big basic things, right? Just kind of, you know, you should buy our Apple product. Does that inspire you to buy anything at all? If you hear someone tell you that, like, hey, you know, you should buy this car because it has four wheels and it'll get you to, you know, uh, from point A to point S or whatever, th that's not inspiring. You know what I'm saying? And so when you look, for example, at Apple, here's how Apple inspires. So they're not, they're not so focused on what they sell. They're focused on why they sell what they sell. And this is what they say, okay? I'll just read it. They say, everything we do, we believe. Say that with me. Everything I do, I believe. Wouldn't that be interesting if we did believe everything that God said about us? They said, everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We challenge everything we do. In other words, right now we created, you know, the iPhone, which by the way, I have the first iPhone. I'm keeping that bad boy just in case one day it's worth a lot of money. But anyways, but they kept, they keep improving their product over and over again. I know many of us are like saying like, yeah, we're the suckers. You know, they're always like adding one more thing that they probably created like five years ago, but they're smart, right? They, they, they're always improving their product. Why? Because they're always wanting to be cutting edge. They want to be up there. They always want to stay innovative. They don't want to stay behind. They're always looking to reinvent themselves. And so they say this, everything, do, everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. Come on, shouldn't we be challenging our status quo? Aren't, I preach this on Wednesday night, aren't you tired of you? I'm so sick of me sometimes. I look at myself, don't even like myself sometimes. Like, what's wrong? I don't like you right now. You, you know, that could be an attitude. It could be a point of view. It can be small thinking, right? It could be having an issue with a person. And, and, but you got to challenge the status quo or you just keep living the same cycle you're living and tell me how that's working for you. 
And so they say, we challenge the status quo, and here's my favorite. We believe in thinking differently. That's what sets us apart as believers. We should be thinking differently in the workplace. If you're working as hard as the employee that doesn't have God, something's wrong with you. Like Christians should be the top of the top, the best of the best employees and employers of any organization. That's what I believe. I believe that you should be the best at what you do. You should be number one at everything you do because we know that the scripture says, and whatever your, find, your hand finds to do, it says, do it with all your heart as unto the Lord. In other words, I don't work for man, I work for God. And so if we had this mindset that we work for God, I think that our work life would elevate just a little bit more. I think most of us would probably be at the higher levels or the places that you're trying to, you know, step into. Maybe it's management. Maybe it's being a supervisor. Maybe it's being a manager. Maybe it's getting a raise. I don't know. But something should say, I value who I am based on why I do what I do. Like God wants us to get to that place. So I want you to write this first point and then we're going to the scripture. The why is the core belief in what you do. Say that the why is my core belief of what I do. Do you ever wonder why you do what you do? Like, I, I, I hope you're getting something out of this today. I really do. I hope you're, you're checking yourself. You're, and I know you can't do that now. You need to go home and sit down and evaluate your life. Like, seriously. Like, if you want to have a different 2020 then you got to start in 2019. Yeah. You, you got to start now. Don't wait too long. Yeah. Ask yourself. Think about the scriptures. If you read the Bible, uh, Jesus was always being questioned on what he was always doing. He's, he's, he's healing a, a guy that's in a cave. He's demon-possessed. He's in a cave for who knows how long. The people of the community kicked this guy out because he was running rampant, terrorizing the community. Nobody can do anything for the guy. No one can heal him. So what do they do? They chain him up and put him in the cave. And this guy is demon-possessed with all kinds of demons. And then Jesus shows up on the scene. The guy comes out like, man, it was like Friday the 13th. This guy's just like coming out with chains. And he's trying to scare Jesus. And Jesus just looked at him. And he told the demons, Out. And the demons had the audacity to try to have a conversation with Jesus. And Jesus ain't having it. The demons said, hey, uh, Jesus, can you give us permission to go into that herd of pigs? And so there's like, like 50 to 100 pigs there. And de listen, Jesus didn't even want to start having a conversation. He just, he just looked at those demons and said, go. So he said, out, go. That's it. The demons go into the pigs, and the Bible says that the pigs, they all began to literally just run, and then off the cliff they went into the ocean. And the people were ticked. I mean, we're talking about this guy was completely bound by demons, broken, busted, disgusted. And they had an issue with what Jesus just did. They were so focused on what he did. How dare you? You just, we just lost a whole lot of good pigs. We laugh, but how many of us live like that? We start questioning a lot of what's and not understand why. Jesus understood why he did what he did. He understood that this man was probably a husband to some wife. Jesus understood that he was probably a father to some children. Jesus knew that he had been in this condition for a very long time, and this was his opportunity to be set free, delivered, and go back and live a better life. Amen? Yeah. That's what God wants from us. Yeah. Every time Jesus, read your Bible, they always, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the haters, right? We all have haters. We all have people that just have an issue with what we do. He heals a man who's lame for 38 years and, and they're ticked at him because they're saying, how dare you heal this man on the Sabbath? Once again, they're like, look at what he's doing. Jesus looks at them and says, hey, listen, what's your problem? If your sheep 
If your herd were to fall in a hole on the Sabbath, you hypocrites, wouldn't you pick that lamb out of that hole and save him? So how much more would I not only heal this man on the Sabbath who has been in that condition for 38 years, but for me to tell him, son, your sins are forgiven as well. So, obviously, we're talking about Scripture. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, let's see if you know this one. One, two, three. For God so loved the world. See how it ends? (laughs) 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 Known this man for a bazillion years. See, God is all about the why. For God so what? Loved. That he did what? Sent. What was the whole purpose of God sending his love? Why did he send his his son? Why? Why? Because he loves you. Because he loves me. That's the why. People got stuck on the what his son was doing. Jesus takes on the same nature of his father. Just like you parents, your children should take on the same nature as you. They should take on the same character as you. Jesus then not only did was he sent, but then the Bible says that Jesus had a mission on earth. His why he was on earth wasn't just because the father loved, but now Jesus had his own why of why he was willing to do what the father asked him. And the Bible says that Jesus made it very clear to everybody. He said, I have come to seek and to save those which are lost. His mission was his daddy's mission. Shouldn't our children fall under that same heart set of why? It's I wonder if your kids know why they're Christians. Have you ever asked them that question? Like, why do you believe what you believe? Or have you ever defined what you believe? That's why I believe that when you look at church stats, they say about 80 to 90 percent. Now it used to be 50 back when I was first coming up in the church, just kind of been born again for maybe two years. And I heard that 50 percent of youth end up leaving the church after high school. It's at 80 percent now. You know why? Because they don't know why. They just do what you do. But don't know why. We have to bring the why back. Because the why is the heart of everything you do. Let me give you more scripture. Are you guys here? Okay, let's, so, so, uh, oh, and and let me tell you something. I'm going to be straight up with you. The moment, and here's the fact, the moment you start being serious about God, ooh, people are going to question you. They're going to question what are you doing on church on Sundays? They're going to question what you do. They're going to question, like, why do you serve at church? Why do you go to church? You know, uh, why do you give? They, they start questioning. When you're sold out for Christ, listen, it's going to happen. It comes with the territory. But I have learned walking now with God for 23 years. I'll just take the last nine years of Elevate Church. When I first started Elevate Church, I was trying to please everybody. You know why? Because I'm just like, man, I just want people to just believe in us. But I have finally come to the conclusion that no matter whether it's three months, one year, six years, nine years, people are always going to complain about what you do. You have to get over what people think about you and what you do for God and start realizing that the reason I don't care what they think is because as long as I know why I do it, and it's in alignment with God's heart, and it's in alignment with God's will, and it's in alignment with God's plan, I'm not going to live the rest of my life looking for man's validation, and I'm going to start pleasing my God and obeying him in every single step I take for him. And so just, just know that you'll get questioned. I'm telling you, the moment you do something that just doesn't make any natural sense, for example, let's take uh, this This woman in Matthew 26, verse 7 through 10, look at what Jesus shares. It says, a woman came to Jesus with a special sealed jar of very expensive perfume. Say very expensive. expensive. Say costly. Costly. Say sacrifice. sacrifice. Look at this. So this woman came with some expensive, costly, sacrificial perfume. 
She poured the perfume on his head while he was at the table. When the disciples saw this, they became what? Angry. They saw what she was doing. They saw what she did. And they're like, what the, what? What? Are y'all seeing that? I bet one of them saw her and then called the rest. You know how that goes, right? And when the disciples saw this, they became angry. Why this waste? They asked. The perfume could have been sold at a high price. Everybody say high price. high price. The money could have been given to the poor people. Liars, liars. That must have been Judas' statement right there. You know he was lying. Jesus was aware of this. Do you realize that Jesus is aware of your, not only what you do, but why you do what you do? That's why God says in the Bible, he says, I weigh the hearts of men. So I rather err doing something right for God than err doing nothing for God. Like, honestly. Like our family throw night, we get a lot of heat on that one. You know why? Because it's Halloween. And I get it, listen. Most people that complain, they're only repeating what someone else said. That's all they're doing. Oh, you're just doing what? Do you know that Halloween's the darkest night of the year? Do you know it's the most evilest, most darkest hour of... I'm thinking like, uh, no, I think if you take all 365 year, days of the year, I think the devil's always at work. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think he picked a holiday. I think man created a holiday. And, we're, and we give him this cheap empowerment as if God takes a break on October 31st. Now, now see, people see, people see what we're doing. They see what... Oh, that day could have been... Wait, you wasted that day. It could have been a day for prayer. It's like, but you don't even come to prayer. What you saying? You know what I'm saying? You barely come to church. You don't even come here and you're complaining. What are you saying? They see what you do. But see, but they'll never ask, Pastor, why are you doing this? Why, 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 why do you do this? I'll tell you why. Because this is a night, and we're the only church that does this on October 31st in Santa Clarita. The reason why we do it is because we seize an opportunity for a community to experience the love of Jesus Christ through the people of this house, not just the people of this house. I believe even as they come to the atmosphere, we have people, and I hope it's happening, Jessica, wherever your wife is, you guys have been interceding, praying, right? We got people that are praying, interceding. We're praying that people will not only experience the love of God through his people, because the Bible says this, and this is how they will know Jesus, by how you, you, how you love one another. Instead of being caught up on what they're doing, what if we started loving one another and realizing that this is an opportunity for us to reach a community that is far, far away from Jesus. And every, listen, and every single time that we have done this, we have always seen the salvation of souls on Halloween night. And we expect no different on this one. We are praying that we'll see more salvations, that people will get more prayer, that people will meet more people that are filled with God's love, God's light, and lives will be changed. Because what good does it do us to try to save the whole world and we lose our own block? We can't do that. Not going to happen. But I could, I could kind of relate what Jesus experienced sometimes. And it happens every year on Halloween. I get emails. Because all they see is what, but they don't know why. Now, they may have their own why, but I don't live for someone's why. And I don't do this alone. We have our board who knows what we do. We have past, We have people that are on our team that respect what we do. And I'm not trying to use this pulpit to be political because I'm not. It's not about being politically correct. It's about finally coming to the conclusion of saying, you know what? What if Christ were to come on October 31st? Because the Bible says no one knows nor hour nor day. Where's the church going to be? Hiding behind their doors? What? I never understand it. And I, trust me, I, I've, I've heard everybody's thoughts and ideas of what they think, but most people are just caught up, caught up on what. And the reality is this, they don't want to know why. 
And most people in your life don't want to know why because they're too busy caught up on your what. The money could have been given to, you, to poor people. Jesus was aware of this, so he said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. I don't know about you, but I think it's going to be a beautiful thing when people come to Christ on October 31st. It's going to be beautiful. And we did it for Jesus. If it was something that builds us, let me tell you something. Then you could probably say, every year that we've done this, this is our second year doing it big where we close off the entire block there or 8th or 9th Street. This church doesn't blow. Oh, my God, it's growing. Wow. No one can ever say that. You know why? Because it costs us more money just to put it together. Time, money, and people. So you could never, no one could ever say that they're doing it for the benefit. They just want a big church. No, listen, it hasn't happened like that. We do it because we have a mantle, we have a mandate. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach this gospel. He didn't say, go into all this world and preach this gospel, except on October 31st. Find me that in scripture. Where did God take a break? Where, did, where does God stop? As a matter of fact, you know, I've been to restaurants, coffee shops, and uh, supermarkets. And in my 23 years of walking with God, I have uh, bought people's groceries right behind me. Like, hey, I'm going to take care of their tab. And, uh, and then restaurants, hey, uh, tell that table I got them. Or I pay for it, then they, then they tell them, hey, you're, you're covered. And they're like, who did this? And I don't do this to be seen. I just do this randomly. Uh, I'm, I'm on budget too, you know. Um, <laughs> coffee shops, you know, I'll buy the, the next two customers behind me and just wait the order, order. And not once in 23 years have I had someone yell at me and say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Every single person has told me, why are you doing this? Because why? matters more than what? Why matters more? The church is focused on what while God is focused on why? Why? That's what matters to Jesus. Why? So uh, please, why? Why do you, why do you do what you do? Answer those questions. I promise you, God promises you through scripture. I'm telling you, people are going to see the greatest miracles, the greatest breakthroughs. You're going to see the greatest deliverances. You're going to see the greatest healings, the greatest restorations when you start asking yourself why. And then you have to qualify that why, whether or not it aligns itself with God's word or is it just your opinion? Is it just your ideology? Or did you create your own theology and now you live by that belief system? Because the truth is this, what was, the, what was the issue with the disciples? Very simple, Proverbs 23, 7 says this, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. It's how you think. See, it's not how you feel. It's about how you think. Because what you think is what creates how you behave. Everything, your why, is rooted in how you think. And how you think will then not only create your character, but then your character then begins to birth out how you behave and so forth, right? After, after you behave the way you behave, you know what behavior does? It leads you into action. So how are you behaving when it comes to the things of God? Are you going into action or are you always making excuses? It's time for change. Another version in the NASB, it says, as he thinks within himself, as he thinks within where? Himself. As you start thinking within your why, so is he. Another version, NIV says this, he is the kind of person who is always thinking about the cause. <coughs> uh, the CSV. CSB says it this way, it's like someone calculating inwardly. See, the woman that poured her perfume out, the reason they used the words, we could have sold that for a high price, was because they were looking at what they could have made. See, sometimes our why, if not careful, can also be misconstrued and it can be a little bit uh, 
tainted with greed, where now you're just doing things just to make more money. You know what I'm saying? Like you're just doing things because you're going you're gonna to benefit you. This woman gave what was costly. Why, why were they so upset? If you look at the study of 300 denarii, which was the worth of that perfume in that time, they say, scholars say, that that perfume was worth, in today's market, about $54,000. See, they were ticked. Because they're like, man, we could have, we could have, we could have, we could have helped the poor. No, 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 you, no, you like the money, honey. You know what I'm saying? See, and for her, her why was, I want to worship my king. It takes sacrifice to come back to your why. And it takes even greater cost for you to choose to want to worship him at any cost at any cost at any like Jesus you're number one at any cost I'll put you first at any cost nothing my success won't matter if you're if you're not in it my 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 wealth won't matter if you're not in it right my prosperity won't matter if you're not in it as long as he's in it man I'm telling you that's a beautiful thing because isn't that what Jesus said he saw how beautiful of a thing she did for him that's where God when you get your wife back and it's a healthy wife God's going to say, beautiful. Beautiful. Don't be the person that said, I'm just following my heart. Don't do that. Look how jacked up we've all been because we followed our heart. Following your heart is like following your feelings. Listen, your feelings are subject to change, but so is your heart. Right? Have you ever had anyone tell you, oh my God, I love you. I'll never leave you. I love you with all my heart. Then they leave you. <laughs> like, I hate it when people tell me, oh, Pastor, I'll never leave you. I'm like, Dan, you're going to be the first one to leave. <laughs> Note to self, they're leaving me. They're leaving me. <laughs> I'm like, Dan. go home. I'm like, babe, they're leaving us. <laughs> Leading from your heart does not control your behavior. Your thoughts do your thoughts as a man thinks in his heart so is he let me give you these quick points quick let's get out of here your why has to be worth it okay like this woman ready number one your why should be stronger than the reasons to quit your why should be stronger than the reasons to quit and we live in a society we live in a culture where quitting is the norm especially christians Always quitting on people, always quitting on vision, always quitting on dreams, always like, stop it. When you quit, then you're basically saying it wasn't worth it. Listen, Gideon was a, a, a coward, a afraid, hiding in a wine press. Why? Because the children of Israel had an enemy who was trying to destroy them. Every, every time they tried to progress, the enemy came and just took it all. And Gideon is hiding. An angel meets him. And the angel of the Lord says to him, Hey, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. Gideon's like, who are you talking to, man? Like, aren't you glad that God sees the potential inside of every single one of us? All of us. He sees the worth. And so, of course, you know the story. I'm not going to get into it. He, he's got to go fight 130,000 soldiers. And all he has is like 32,000 men. And God says, you got too many. Then he brings them down to like 10,000 men. He says, you still got too many. And he's like, and then he brings them down to 300. So it was 300 versus 130,000 men. And so he goes for the fight. Because why? Because his why was God is with us. Judges 8, 4 says, and Gideon and his 300 men exhausted. Everybody say exhausted. And maybe you're tired today. Maybe you're exhausted. Maybe you feel like quitting right now. But guess what? Gideon understands what it feels to fight 130,000 men and still chase them down because there was too many of them to kill. That he was willing to keep chasing them. Most people, the moment you get a little bit of victory, you know what we do as Christians? We stop. We stop. We like a little, we like, we like the mountaintop. God's like, get off the mountain. There's more to conquer. And then we wonder why we're unsatisfied, why we're unhappy. But Gideon said they were exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit came to the Jordan and they what? 
crossed it. They were not going to finish by seeing men run. They were going to finish by not only reaching the Jordan, but crossing it over. Amen? Come on. Number two, your why can be about changing your life, your family, a generation, the world. David did that. David shows up to the children of Israel battlefield against them and Goliath. Goliath is taunting them, tormenting them, holding them back from launching into destiny. And they're just sitting there. David shows up and says, what are you doing? Why are we standing around? He gave them a why. He said, who's this uncircumcised Philistine trying to come up against the armies of God? His why is my God is bigger than that Goliath. For sake of time, number three, assign your why to your task or goal. Assign your why. Don't just say, for example, I'm going to lose weight, praise God, like a lot of us did on January 2019, right? We said we lose 20 pounds, but we've gained 40, right? I'm going to lose weight. It hasn't happened. It's hard to lose weight. You know why? There's no incentive when you just say, I want to lose weight. It's not, ooh. You and like 7 billion other people on earth. But you know what? What if you assigned a why to that? Like, I want to, I'm going to lose 40 pounds of weight because I don't want that same gene, that same generational curse of diabetes to affect my life one day. I don't want to be sick. I want to be healthy. See, that's why I want to lose 20 pounds. And that just changes the whole game, right? But if you just say, I want to lose weight, you know you ain't losing it. I want to go to church more often. You know you don't end up going to church more often. You go to church less often. But when you have a why, why do I go there? I go there because I lead my family. I go there because I worship my God. I go there because I need my children to know the ways of God. Not only do I raise them up at home, but I raise them up in God's house. The reason I go there is because I need godly relationships in my life. The reason I go there is because I'm going to be confronted and challenged. And I know I'm not going to like pastor sometimes because he's talking to me. But that's okay. But I'm ready to grow. Amen.